59th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in 2017. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're turned to silent. Uh, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Um, are, are members agreed that to take agenda item three in private today? Our main item of business today is to take evidence from Ofcom on the regulation of broadcasters and in particular the BBC. Uh, I'd like to welcome our witnesses, uh, Glenn Preston, Director Scotland for Ofcom, and Kevin Bakehurst, Group Director, Content and Media Policy at Ofcom. And I'd like, um, I'd like to invite Ofcom to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Uh, thanks for the invitation to appear before the committee today. Um, you'll recall that Kevin and I came to see you in February, uh, where we discussed some of the main features of Ofcom becoming the first independent regulator of the BBC. Uh, we touched then on the separation of governance and regulation. Uh, we touched on our role in setting the formal regulatory requirements. Uh, and we set out some of our early thinking then on how we'd hold the BBC to account. Uh, we consulted on those principles in our draft operating licence and performance measures between March and July of this year, uh, and the end result was our statement published uh, recently on the 13th of October called Holding the BBC to Account for Delivering for Audiences. What that does is set out the first operating licence and accompanying performance framework for the BBC. It covers the processes for setting and amending the licence in future, uh, and there are some detailed annexes uh, that explain how we took account of consultation responses and of the BBC's interim annual plan, which they published at the beginning of July this year. Uh, we also published, I think you have it in your, your papers that were published for today's committee meeting, a document called the BBC's Services Audiences in Scotland, where people can find all of the regulatory conditions as they apply to Scotland in a single place. Under the performance measurement framework, we'll publish an annual research report that will look at how the BBC has been delivering the mission and public purposes through the UK public services. Uh, and the evidence that's gathered for the preparation of that report will ensure any future changes to the licence are fully, fully evidenced. We are committed simultaneously to updating the audiences in Scotland document as the licence evolves and the regulatory conditions relating to Scotland change. The BBC has a responsibility to deliver content that meets the needs of audiences across all of the UK. Uh, it was noted in the SPICE briefing for today's session that there are two principal areas of public purpose for the BBC to provide output and services that meet the needs of the United Kingdom's nations, regions and communities, um, and to invest in the creative economies of each of the nations and contribute to their development. We have set objectives for the BBC in relation to the nations and regions. It must accurately represent and authentically portray all audience groups and it must also distribute its production resources and support creative industries across the UK. Our approach is intended to provide a greater focus on production in each nation of the UK and on guaranteed levels of programmes for the nations and regions, including in Scotland. Uh, in February, we discussed Ofcom's out of London guidance, out of London production guidance, uh, and we've now committed to reviewing the guidance in light of our new BBC duties and the broader developments in the UK production landscape. Uh, we are in the middle of scoping the project. We had two really helpful recent sessions in Glasgow with representative, representatives from the broadcasters, uh, from the independent production sector in Scotland, and our own uh, advisory committee for Scotland. And our intention is to publish a call, a fuller call for evidence in the first quarter of next year. Our new responsibilities have also required us to consult on procedures for enforcement of BBC competition requirements. Uh, the committee will be well aware of the proposals for a new BBC Scotland channel. We discussed it in February after the BBC themselves gave evidence then. It will be the first test of our approach and processes where Ofcom must consider whether the public value of the proposal justifies any adverse impact on fair and effective competition. We're going to conduct that uh, in two phases. That assessment is going to be done in two phases. In the first, which we will complete in the first half of January, uh, we will decide if we agree with the BBC's view that its proposal represents a material change to its public services. 
Last week, uh, on the announcement of uh, our, our first phase after the BBC had published its public interest test, we had some initial conversations in Edinburgh with key stakeholders who may be affected by the proposal. So that will inform our decision about the materiality. There are two types of assessment we could, take, uh, could undertake in phase two. Both involve public consultation. Uh, the first is called a BBC competition assessment, which can take up to six months. Uh, if we decide the BBC's proposal raises large, complex or particularly contentious issues. Uh, the second is called a shorter assessment and we'll generally conduct one of those if we think the BBC proposal involves a more targeted set of issues which we'd expect to resolve in a shorter period of time. Uh, convener, I'll just close by touching briefly on the issue of diversity. Uh, Ofcom expects the BBC to lead the way in addressing underrepresentation. In our new operating licence, we've set a range of requirements to ensure the BBC is publicly accountable for achieving its workforce diversity targets. These include 15% of staff to be from ethnic minority groups and 50% of all staff and leadership roles to be held by women by 2020. Under the licence, the BBC must also measure and report annually on its on-screen and on-air diversity, and we will scrutinise the BBC's performance to assess whether it's making sufficient progress in serving the UK's diverse communities, and whether the audiences themselves are satisfied. Kevin, I hope that's a useful update for the committee um, on the current state of play, and Kevin and I look forward to discussing these issues with you. Uh, thank you very much for that opening statement. Um, if I could just uh, begin um, by um, welcoming the fact that you're reviewing the Out of London guidelines. When you spoke to us in February, you, you said that you were going to be very um, tough in the way that you in, in, uh, held uh, BBC in particular to, to account uh, over what constituted a Made in Scotland programme. But you'll know if you've sat down with the independent producers, as I'm sure you do all the time, that they're very unhappy with the way that those guidelines are interpreted by the BBC. So can I ask you how you intend to address concerns uh, from the independent producers about the accuracy of measures uh, used by the BBC to identify Scottish production and whether you're confident um, that the criteria of what constitutes a Scottish production adheres to the public purpose of the BBC that you've talked about? Yes, uh, Kamini, I think I can um, have a go at answering that. Um, so the Out of London uh, production review uh, was <coughs> in substantial part actually um, something that um, came to our attention through um, some Scottish independent production companies and producers. Um, we looked at a number of uh, programmes, individual programmes that they uh, had concerns about. Uh, and my view and the view of our team was that um, some of those programmes met the criteria, they met the guidelines as they are at the moment. But I think our view was that didn't deliver what the guidelines were supposed to deliver in terms of proper development, uh, proper investment and development of the creative industries in in Scotland and, and uh, other nations when we looked at some of those. So that was what kicked it off. So the team have been um, scoping out, you know, how the um, the scope of the, uh, the work we're doing. They've been talking to independent producers, they've been talking to broadcasters uh, and other interesting parties. Uh, it will be quite a public uh, process. Um, we're going to put out, as Glenn said, we're going to put out a formal kind of uh, invitation for people to submit um, uh, expressions and views at the beginning of, of 2018. Um, I suspect that what, you know, this is, this is a, uh, you know, it's a very complex area and, you know, there are quite a lot of uh, <clears throat> certainly broadcasters and, and in independent production companies who say, they don't think they, we need substantial change. Um, you know, there are other voices which say there isn't enough transparency about actually production bases, for example, what, what constitutes a substantial production base, what kind of spend uh, leads to qualification. Um, so, you know, it is, it's a complex piece of work and it's going to have an impact on both production companies and broadcasters. So it's going to be, uh, you know, done over 2018 but I have no doubt that two things will come out of it. One is probably a need for greater transparency around um, the register, if you like. When people say they qualify, what do they mean by that? Um, uh, and also probably more rigor in terms of um, Ofcom looking at 
you know, uh, probably on a regular basis, um, the information that's given and what exactly that means. As you said yourself, the, the public purpose is that there are there are two that affect Scotland. One is that you support the creative economy in in, in Scotland um, uh, in in the commissioning, and the other one is that you they reflect the nation uh, to the rest of the UK. And there's obviously a tension between those two because you could be making a program uh, for, which is badged as a Scottish program which has nothing at all to do with Scotland, but you could justify it in terms of the public purpose of supporting creative industries in Scotland. But um, it's still hard to see um, how, for example, looking at your own list uh, here, the Women's FA Cup final between Arsenal and Chelsea, or the England v Serbia Euro 2017 qualifier, um, qualifies as a Scottish production that meets both of those public purpose criteria. Yes. So you'd be right, the, the portrayal and representation of, of um, Scotland is one of our, also you know, is one of our main concerns alongside investment in the creative industries. I think, you know, frankly, you know, for Scotland or for the other nations to have a truly vibrant, diverse creative sector, they should produce, be, produce, be producing and be enabled to produce a range of those kind of programmes. You know, I would love to see you know, more world-class um, production companies based in Scotland who are producing sport, for example. And there are some already. Sunset and Vine is a very successful example. We'll make those two. Yeah, um, yeah. And, 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 you know, for, for the creative sector to have the, the breadth of uh, talent, um, for it to bring in, you know, create jobs and bring in the right kind of uh, investment here, I, I think it's really important that, that those kind of programs are not just written out of it because, you know, but it's equally important that there is an emphasis put on representation and portrayal. And there are other tools we're going to use alongside the Outer London Review on that, particularly around the BBC. Um, and I think we mentioned before our, our first ad hoc review into the BBC in 2018 is going to be a, a comprehensive look at uh, portrayal and representation of the peoples of the United Kingdom, which includes the diverse groups that are well known, but also the nations of the United Kingdom as well. So we're just scoping that work out at the moment. So there's a number of tools. I, I would urge people not to dismiss programs like the Women's FA Cup final, because if it brings investment to a different part of the creative sector, it just needs to be seen alongside parts of the creative sector that also do promote representation and portrayal as well for it to be a truly vibrant uh, sector here. We all support women's football and, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong yeah. with the, the programs it's just that you know like this they are they are part of the scottish allocation you know like so the bbc can turn, turn around and say we're, we're meeting this the criteria but it includes things like that and in terms of like drama for example it includes things like rillington place which is about the john christie murders um in uh, notting hill i believe in london um again that's a, Sc a scottish drama um, but the, it's got absolutely nothing to do with Scotland and our, the, the casting wouldn't have been Scottish and the production would have not taken place here. So clearly there's there's a question mark over that, isn't there? But I think that's why that's why the range of, of measures and also the range of types of production is really important. So, you know, another thing we've been looking at is, uh, and we've had representations about, is the percentage of the licence fee that is spent uh, here in Scotland uh, and in Wales and Northern Ireland. Now, one of the reasons that, you know, particularly take, for example, Wales um, uh, has got seemingly a higher proportion of licence fees collected in Wales as a total spent there is because they have created a very successful drama studios in Cardiff, which is producing some really expensive top-end drama there as part of the overall industry there. So, you know, I think... To have and, and a lot of those dramas, Doctor Who, for example, which is uh, or Casualty, which are made in Wales, don't contribute a huge amount to the portrayal or representation of Welsh people, but they do contribute a huge amount to the creative economy in Wales. So that's why I say a, a breadth of the creative economy is, is what we would aim to do, frankly. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So, if yeah. it's but if it's not portraying Scotland, you would have expected a large proportion of the spend to be in Scotland to support the creative industries, and certainly there's there's a feeling that that's that's not happening. So how yeah. soon are we going to get these guidelines reviewed? Well, the, the work is already underway. Uh, uh -huh. As Glenn said, we've been talking to the key stakeholders in scoping it out. We're going to go out publicly 
in the early new year and ask for calls for input, as we call it, which is frankly for submissions from people who have an interest in, in this area. We'll then, take, we'll then have a, a, a look at all those. We'll then come out with our set of proposals um, during 2018 for uh, public consultation. So it'll be uh, within the next, within 2018 is what, it, is what we're looking at. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thanks very much. Um, I wanted to follow up on a couple of the points you've just addressed. Clearly, there is an important distinction to be made between portraying uh, the nations and regions of, of the UK and investment and creativity within the nations and regions of the UK, and I completely accept that. But when, you, when you're reviewing uh, the issue of diversity, and, and you said that's work that's underway, uh, and, and that's about uh, portrayal, authentic portrayal and reflecting the diverse communities, uh, as well as uh, what you, I think you described as the traditional or the well-known diversities and, and the nations, will you also be looking at the regions within the nations? In other words, uh, 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 understanding that the portrayal of Scotland is not simply about a single uh, representation, but about the diversity of, of, of Scotland. Um, well, the answer is we, we're scoping it out at the moment. Um, certainly part of the work that I've been talking about, we're talking about um, focus groups in different parts of Scotland. Um, frankly, how much granular detail we can get into on regions of Scotland or indeed regions of England in this piece of work uh, is a question of resource and proportionality because uh, I was very keen to look at the regions of Scotland. I know that's um, uh, very dear to uh, a lot of people's hearts here and it's an important part of what the broadcasters do or should be doing. Um, but the, uh, the honest answer is the, the costs ratchet up very substantially the more granular you get. So the least we will do is have, uh, uh, or the least we're looking at at the moment is having focus groups around in different parts of Scotland and not, not just in one part of Scotland to try and at least pick up some of that, yeah. That's welcome. Clearly the, the, the phrase nations and regions can be taken to mean three nations and five or six macro regions within England. And, and that, is, that is at a very ha large scale, if you like, and doesn't re reflect uh, the reality of, of diverse communities on the ground. Can I ask, that's covered by the objectives and regulatory conditions particular to Scotland. Can I ask about another couple of aspects of those particular uh, requirements? First of all, in Gaelic, and particularly on the number of hours allocated for those learning Gaelic, and also uh, the, the uh, treatment of BBC Alipa, just to, if you could uh, uh, indicate the basis on which the, for example, the five hours for Gaelic learning has been reached uh, and what uh, consideration there has been of some of the other issues facing Alipa going forward. Yeah, well, I, I'll start to answer that and Glenn can maybe pick up uh, on the wider point. Um, suffice to say, I think we, we have a lot of uh, communication with BBC Alba. Um, I went up with uh, my colleague Alan, who's sitting behind here in the summer, to Sauna Way to go and see uh, MG Alba and uh, the teams there and also some of the independent producers based in Stornoway um, to try and actually understand firsthand what are the things that would help build BBC Alba and MG Alba and create a more, uh, I mean, it's a really impressive production industry there, but actually what more would they be looking for, if you like, in terms of regulatory support or whatever. Um, so this is an area, you know, that we do take seriously. Um, I'm hoping... Uh, and I've mentioned this to people at the BBC, that some of the work on the BBC Scotland channel will involve, and I know they're working closely, they already told me with MG Alba about looking at co-commissioning um, so that there could be a positive spin-off also from the investment in the BBC Scotland channel working alongside um, MG Alba and BBC Alba. So, um, you know, we certainly have been, in my one year in the job, we've been doing a fair bit of work on that and talking to MG Alba itself. Um, Glenn, is there anything else? You want? So I think there's probably two additional points. So in um, the license conditions as they apply specifically to Scotland, um, we have included a new requirement for 75% of original productions of all hours transmitted on BBC Alba. So that, that is, that's something new that they will have to have to meet. The, the broader point that, um, that Kevin mentioned is worth just focusing on as well. So we, we are having conversations um, with MG Alba and with BBC Scotland uh, to ensure that they are they are talking jointly about you know what what they want to achieve in a strategic a strategic sense, Ofcom has for a number of years had a role in uh, reviewing MG Alba's operational protocol, um, which is 
uh, a, a bit about the kind of pay and rations, uh, which is the bit we're actually legislatively mandated to do, uh, but has also been about thinking about you know, other sources of income, uh, other strategic approaches they can take to, to promote Gaelic and, and, the, and the Gaelic language. Um, and we think in, in this new world um, where uh, we are now regulating the BBC that there's a, a, a strong case for the BBC and MG Alba to sit down and produce something you know, in, a, in a joint fashion uh, that really takes a strategic look at these things, which I know both organisations are interested in doing. Excellent. And, and my last question, if I may, convener, is in relation to the objectives and regulations, particularly to Scotland, and domestic radio output. And again, how you see the regulatory regime supporting uh, radio output, not just in Scotland, but uh, again, across Scotland on, on that regional basis, as, as currently happens. Um. I mean, when we designed the operating license, uh, <clears throat> it was designed to, I mean, obviously there's several requirements on, on Radio Scotland um, uh, and other BBC radio services here. Um, I know the BBC are currently, you know, the, I was, uh, they just appointed Steve Carson, who's looking multi, in a multimedia way, and I know that one of the key areas he is looking at is future investment in radio in Scotland. Um, and it's something, you know, the, those kind of investment decisions are something for the BBC, and they have limited budgets, but I know they're looking at, um, you know, potential possibly new radio services, but in, uh, continued investment um, in Radio Scotland, and um, that's a priority for Steve. So, uh, but it's something we track carefully because we know the value of it. And it's maybe just worth, I was, I was reminding myself about the specific provisions, um, and it is maybe just worth repeating them here. So uh, in each week, at least 50 hours are allocated to news and current affairs, including repeats. And this is in respect to BBC Radio Scotland. Um, just picking up, Mr MacDonald, on your point about kind of regional representation, um, there is a, an obligation that Radio Scotland provides several regional opt-outs each weekday, offering news, sport and information, and some regional opt-out community programme in the evenings. Uh, and also we have uh, obligations in respect of content and music of particular relevance to Scotland as well. And, and, and I think I take it from what you're saying that any review of those would strengthen rather than reduce uh, the level of those requirements, for example, for regional opt-outs. Yeah. Well, the, most of the requirements in the, in the operating licence are we've set floors, not ceilings, so it'd be clear to the BBC this is, you know, they, we would expect them to over-deliver on those. Um, they're not a target for them. They're a floor that they should be above, in our view. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Jackson Carlow. Good morning. Um, when we saw you last, of course, you were preparing to take on this new responsibility. Uh, and I'd be quite interested to know a little more about the operational structure that you've now put in place. Um, you were looking to recruit additional people. From where those people have, in fact, been recruited? Were, were they from within Scotland, or have they relocated to Scotland, since we're talking about Scottish content? Um, and how have you determined what their... Uh, focus and responsibilities will be? How is this resource being deployed in terms of the function that you now have? Okay, so uh, I don't want to bore you too much about our internal structures, but I will uh, try and answer your question the best I can, which is, so we work very closely with Glenn, first of all, um, in terms of uh, our duties in Scotland. And as you'll know, we now have, I think, 27 people in our Edinburgh office, which is substantially higher than um, we had in the past, and we there are plans to try and grow that further still. Um, so you in February. So that, so that, that, that remains. We actually have an ambition to go to between 40 and 50, which I think will take another 12 to 18 months from this point. Um, but we have grown from, uh, as Kevin said, uh, I think we had about 16 last October, October 2016. We're now just under 30. Uh, we have now this, this is across all of our all of Ofcom's groups, so not just in relation to content and media policy, but we have competition specialists and spectrum specialists and uh, research specialists, for example. Um, but the the office that we have in Edinburgh is capable of, uh, of holding to 40 to 50, and that's the ambition that we continue to have. And that would, I expect, include some additional people uh, on the content and media policy. Policy side. Okay. Um, just in general terms, what we try to do is um, uh, uh, there was a discussion about whether we should have a separate team within Ofcom to look at BBC work apart from our other broadcasting work. Um, my view, having sp have got there and spoken to colleagues, was there is a real strength in having an overview of the whole of broadcasting and media, so that teams working on the BBC would understand the concerns, um, the issues of other stakeholders as well. So. We've combined the teams. There are, <clears throat> at any at any given time, there's a team who would be working. For example, we have a team currently working on um, our work around the BBC Scotland channel. Um, 
some of them are based up in, in the Edinburgh office, some of them are in our competition team in London, and they're working together on that. So, you know, we create bespoke teams. Overall, the team is, you know, are combined, and they would tend to be across three areas. One is editorial standards, which Ofcom's obviously got a track record on across the industry, um, where they're taking on now the BBC responsibilities as well. The second one is competition, which we've touched on because of uh, in uh, the BBC Scotland channel. And the third one is about performance. So there'll be a, a team who um, who worked on the operating license of the BBC and will be working on um, the measurement, the measuring, and our first annual report on the BBC uh, in the autumn of 2018. And, and I'm intrigued. Wh what are, from where do you recruit individuals? What is the experience of the people who will be performing these functions in relation to scrutiny of? Uh, broadcasting of the BBC? Are they, are they broad, uh, people who've been previously formerly in the broadcasting industry themselves? Yes, well... They're not all on <coughs> BBC-type salaries, I hope, are they? Sadly for them, they're not. No. But, um, <laughs> uh, no, we have... I mean, all these... Every job we've done has been an open competition. And, uh, um, and frankly, uh, you know, we go out there and people externally apply and internally at Ofcom apply, and it tends to be a mixture. So just to give you a flavour to try and answer your question, uh, we've recruited people, several people from broadcasting backgrounds, from Sky, from the BBC, um, from uh, other organisations. We've got a small number who came from the BBC Trust with specialist knowledge, probably four or five, I, I guess, um, out of a team of nearly 100 at, at Ofcom. Um, and then there are people who come in with specific knowledge of competition, for example. Um, so they tend to come from a variety of backgrounds. We very deliberately, you know, try to make sure that, that there is a varied background from different broadcasters and also with understanding of regulation as well as combination of those two things. Right. There is, sorry, there's, one, there's one additional point worth making here, which is we are moving towards location neutrality um, for advertising all of Ofcom's jobs. There are some specialist jobs that are located in particular bits of the United Kingdom, um, but virtually all of the jobs that Ofcom now advertises will be advertised as, as, as location neutral. Um, in practice, that would mean people being based either in Edinburgh, um, which is one of the available sites, or, or London, certainly working on these types of issues. And just, and just one final question on this. I mean, in terms of the expectation you had in planning for the responsibility when it came in April, um, has the plan that you imagined you would be putting in place been the one you have employed, or have there been some unexpected ways in which you've had to adjust or amend that? Um, I think the, one of the important things... Uh, I mean, there was a long process to decide what the best way to try and regulate the BBC was, to allow the BBC the right amount of creative um, freedom to do the very best it can, but also to make sure that the key requirements of the Charter and Agreement were in place. So the sort of hundred or so requirements we put on the BBC would be a reflection of what the Charter and Agreement asked us to look at or to put in place, or key areas in terms of delivering um, the sort of things we've been talking about, which is representation, portrayal, investment, um, uh, key key genres of programming that otherwise the BBC may not do, uh, key commitments in in peak times on BBC One, for example, uh, to particular types of programming that otherwise the BBC may be tempted not to do. Um, you know the requirements on Radio Scotland, where we think it's important for audiences and the audience values a certain amount of news content, for example. Um, so have we amended it? Um, we did do, yeah, we amended some things because of representations from the BBC, which were that certain things were not workable, which we saw the, um, they gave us the facts and figures and we accepted that in other areas. An example of that would be, for example, the percentage quota for, for, uh, for England for um, uh, network production, where the BBC previously had put in multi-centre productions into that and they said they were not going to do that so we needed to amend that. those are sort of, the sort of things we'd have changed but there were other things the BBC asked us to change for example the the quotas on hours that we put in for Scotland Wales and Northern Ireland uh, which we in the end we heard what they said we didn't think that there was a convincing argument and we thought it was important not just to have a percentage of spend in Scotland as a floor but a percentage of hours because that is a way of frankly making sure there is a range of production in Scotland, for example, um, you can put a percentage of spend in, but 8% of spend could be all spent on 
one very expensive uh, genre, if you put in a, a, an 8% of network hours, it means there is, there's there's got to be a range of programs, basically. So, you know, there was, yeah, toing and froing. And I think the, one of the important things, is this is the first operating license we put out. Um, undoubtedly, you know, we will have to make changes, and we should. It should be a living document, because audience patterns will change. The BBC is changing its plans for Scotland, so we will have to amend the license to take into account the new BBC Scotland channel in terms of the hours we set, for example, for you know, uh, BBC Two Scotland or whatever. So, you know, there will have to be amendments over time. Um, and it sh that's the way it should be, in my view. It shouldn't just be set in stone because the market's changing very quickly. Audiences are changing really quickly. Okay. There is, I mean, sorry. For, for jumping in there, there's, there is one other um, broad point about kind of how much it costs to regulate, I guess, which is uh, one, of the, one of the questions that we touched on um, last time we were here in February. And we, we had an, a, an indicative additional budget for 2017-18 of eight and a half million uh, we think we'll come in within that within that budget um, it, it is the case of course that the costs may change year on year as Kevin says as as how we're regulating and what we're regulating changes if there's any favorable variance in the balance we would return that to the BBC for example um, within the uh, the next for the next year's fees um, so we are flexible in how we approach these things okay that's very helpful thank you to uh, Lockhead thank you very much Many of the questions I was going to ask have been covered already, but one outstanding question I have is in relation to productions that have had uh, public money being available to the public uh, on a permanent basis. So I, I, I remember Scotland's Music with Phil Cunningham, which was a great series, it was on television, and I've always wanted to see it again because I missed some of the episodes, and I don't understand why that's not constantly, constantly publicly available, given that public money was used for producing that programme, presumably. And I just wondered whether you thought uh, there should be guidelines or if there are guidelines or should be regulation over public access to programmes that have been made with public money. Yeah. Uh, I think you'd like the Proclaimers programme as well, didn't you? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm impressed that you know that. <laughs> um, the answer is this... Uh, the BBC itself would like to make more of the back catalogue available to people. Um, that there is a, there is always a cost question, and there is a, an agreement with independent production companies as well, and with and with artists and so on. So there is a cost implication of making programmes available long term. Now I think the BBC is consist is more consistently now trying to make sure they can because they're trying to build the iPlayer so that they need, they want more content on it and they want more content beyond 30 days on it where they can, but they have to weigh that against the cost of doing that. And particularly some programmes, particularly with music rights. Um, there is quite a significant cost uh, to them in doing that. So, yes, as a public interest, they've got to weigh that up against the level of public interest against the cost of doing it, frankly, and that has got to be something that they uh, only they can look at that because they've got to weigh up where they spend their money. But just uh, if there's been a huge amount of creative effort put into a production that's of cultural importance to our country and public money has contributed towards that, is there not perhaps a principle that that should be available on a permanent basis to the country? Uh, and that's my point, really, is mm. should that not be something that perhaps could be subject of guidelines or regulation from Ofcom? Because it just strikes me as bizarre that these productions are made and then hidden away for, for time immemorial in some cases. Yeah, it is. Uh, rights is a highly complicated area, and there's lots of stakeholders in it. I agree with you in principle that things that are of cultural importance should be a priority. Um, but you know, each individual program, there are significant rights uh, negotiations and issues around them, whether that's with independent production companies, whether it's with equity, whether it's with musicians, union, and rightly so. You know, that people should expect to get some payment if the program is consistently being shown, but there is a price tag on that for the BBC, and they've got to think, they've got to weigh that up against investment in new content as well. So I don't disagree with you in principle. I think practically that's an issue for the BBC. Um, and I'm sure that they would put a priority on things that are of cultural importance, but they've got to weigh all those things up. Cool. Hopefully you reflect. Sorry, on that's that. not very. That's not <laughs> probably what you want to hear, but it's. Uh, well, I think that's I'd like to reflect yeah. on it because it is. Yeah, sure. No, we'll, we'll, we'll go and money, think about so. it. Yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. Um, I know recently the Ofcom has accused the BBC of um, being reliant on too many repeats of films and sitcoms and uh, long-running daytime shows. Um, and I know uh, that you, Kevin, recommended that the, the BBC provide more original um, UK drama. However, I do quite like a, 
uh, a nice black and white movie, weepy movie on a Sunday afternoon, I have to say. Um, so, <laughs> something a bit, you know, you did recommend that perhaps um, more uh, original drama such as Mrs. Brown's Boys was um, televised. I just wondered, can you talk us through the process of, process of how you persuade the BBC to, to um, be more creative? No, oh, that's a really good question. Um, I'm sorry we're taking away your black and white movies, yeah. but uh, you can get them on Netflix probably. Um, <laughs> um, how do you persuade the BBC to more, be more creative? Well, I think... So we saw a number of things. That you're right, we, we, and we looked at what the audiences really value about the BBC, and um, original UK productions that reflect lives in the UK, whether that's drama or factual entertainment, are the things the audience really value. What we tried to do was to say these things are important to the audience. They're also, um, frankly, you know, define what the BBC should do. It's what the Charter and Agreement also asked the BBC to do. Um, and whether that's in children's UK content, uh, which the BBC has become, you know, pretty much the only commissioner of some aspects of children's content, which are hugely valued by the audience and by parents and so on. Um, whether that's in drama or whatever. So it is to, it's to point out what is valued. In some cases, it's to set a requirement of a minimum number of hours for key genres, arts programs, um, would be one. In some ways, it's about leaving the BBC the, creative, the freedom to make it the best creative choices it can do, because you know the BBC has to, the BBC board and the BBC executive have to be able to manage the BBC. Um, you know, they have all the facts at their fingertips. They have the people who make these create and brilliant creative people within the organisation. And it, it is a bit about, you know, striking the right balance between making sure we protect key genres um, or stand up for key things that we believe in, which is representation, portrayal, and so on, which is important to audiences and is in the charter and agreement, but allowing the BBC the space to make the best creative decisions it can make. Um, I also wanted to ask you, um, in order for the BBC to spend the same per head on viewers, which is the, obviously the ultimate aim, how long do you think this will um, take and how do you actually measure that change? Uh, how long will it take? Um, well, we can do, I think our role is to try and make sure we can create the environment, the best environment for that to be possible and likely for the BBC and other broadcasters to spend more in, in the nations of the UK. In the end, we can't decide what the B we shouldn't be deciding what the BBC spends, but we will measure it. We put it out publicly. Uh, <clears throat> how long will it take? It kind of depends on the decisions the BBC takes about spend. Um, you know, it comes back to what I was saying about allowing the BBC the creative decisions. If they want to make a really expensive drama in Northern Ireland or Wales or whatever, and that skews spending or a few expensive dramas in Wales, which is what they're currently doing, but that's in their view the best place to do that, and they've got the creative communities that, and the studios to do it, then that has to be a decision of the BBC. The most effective way of, uh, and, and, and I read the, the evidence the BBC gave here about their intent of increasing spending in Scotland, which we would welcome, but the, the most effective way to enable that to happen is frankly to do what we're trying to do, which is to make sure the creative economy here has the right mix of skills, the right investment, the right range of programs being made here. Um, and then, you know, when it has, if it has the right script writers, then drama will come. If it has the right studios, different types of programs will come. And that's a, that's, those sort of factors are slightly outside our hands, but we can just try and create the best conditions for it and also make it clear that we think it's important that, it, that uh, representation and portrayal does improve. Just got one last point. Um, do you believe that the, the regulations that you are um, obliged to, uh, to ask the BBC to meet. Do you believe that that will have an effect on the quality um, that is being produced? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, undoubtedly. You know, so, you know, making sure that there is a substantial commitment to children's programming, making sure there's a commitment to arts, religious programming, current affairs, news in peak time, regional news. Um, you know, these are the sort of things, frankly, I'm sure the BBC like would and should be doing, but there's no guarantee. And it's putting a flaw there, making sure that they, those valued 
genres the audience really care about um, remain in a priority for the BBC when they've got lots of other priorities, lots of other areas they want to spend uh, money on um, and lots of other services I'm sure they'd like to create. But some of those genres are really valued by you know, significant parts of the audience. So hopefully, yes, we're going to make a, a set a, a you know, set a minimum standard for some of those areas, and I hope the BBC will exceed it in many cases. Okay. I think it's, it's maybe just worth adding one additional point on that. I, I mentioned in my opening remarks that we'll, re we'll report annually um, on how the BBC are um, performing against, um, against these obligations. And I think you know, we, we would expect to have conversations about your quality point um, when uh, we're out and about in Scotland talking to audiences about whether they think they're getting the quality um, that the BBC are obligated to give to them. So we, we, we will have a tool by which we can, uh, we can comment on those issues. Okay. Hey, Tavish Scott. Thank you. I wonder if I could ask the kind of um, the crown versus blue planet question, which is maybe the opposite end of the spectrum to the one Lewis, has asked, Lewis McDonald was asking about uh, local radio stations, because I could do that all afternoon and bore you about that. But um, uh, I suppose my concern at the moment is uh, Netflix, Amazon, Disney, Fox, and that happening across the other side of the Atlantic, huge international pressures uh, uh, on uh, bro broadcasting competition. Do you worry at any stage that we'll all get so obsessed by the nuts and bolts of pence spent here and pence spent there, miss the big picture, which is the BBC, like every other state broadcaster of that point of view, is, not, is going to be under enormous pressure from these international uh, vast organisations who are competing absolutely head-on for customers and doing it very well? Yeah. I think that's a key part of what we have to do, and not just for the BBC, but for Channel 4 in particular, who would be under you know, pressure, ITV. These are also our stakeholders. These are also public service broadcasters. You know, what are Ofcom's role in supporting public service broadcasting in the UK is there. It's in statute that we should be doing it. It provides a lot of what is valuable for audiences and society. Um, and yes, we are having constant conversations and also with other stakeholders like Sky, um, you know, who provide an excellent service themselves. Um, to consumers about these existential threats, if you like, and the BBC's voiced them quite explicitly about Netflix, for example. And you know, so that yes is the answer. Yes is the answer to your question. You know, when an when an organisation like you know, Fox, for example, you know, is said to say that it's not big enough, and therefore is looking to link up with Disney, and Fox is an enormous organisation, um, that says something about the way the world is going and. You know, so yes is the answer, and one of the things we are constantly talking to the BBC and other broadcasters about is how they can work better together um, to, you know, to protect British content and British broadcasting. And, you know, I mean, I think I said in, in um, publicly that I actually think for audiences this is a particularly golden period because the amount of choice, the amount of the the range of ways you can view content. Yes, the Crown on Netflix. Blue Planet on the BBC, but a whole range of other fantastic programming across our broadcasters and international broadcasters. The audience have never had so much choice and high quality choice. Um, but it may be a moment in time, and you know, you do look at the pressures and commercial pressures as well on ITV and Channel Four. You know, who've seen a downturn in the advertising market. That means reduced investment in content, probably because that's what they have to do. So. You know that golden period may not go go on forever, and part of our job is to try and make sure. And one of the ways, frankly, that the BBC, ITV, and Channel Four, uh, you know, will stand up to Netflix and Amazon and so on is investment in UK and British content that reflects the lives of British people. Because I don't foresee that in the near future any of those big organisations are going to be. So the Crown, you know, might pre might represent a very small part of British society, but you know, in terms of representing people's interests, their daily lives, the issues that affect them. That's a unique proposition for the British broadcasters, and frankly, it's it's one way of of them also um, protecting themselves going on to the future. I think. Thank you. Is Stuart McMillan. Yeah, okay. Actually, it follows on from that area. It just it struck me there was two programmes uh, in recent years that uh, I thought were really interesting. One was on ITV. It was uh, Robson Green's Northumberland, uh, and uh, I thought it was, it was a fascinating programme and certainly very informative. Now, BBC don't do anything like that. Also, the BBC, uh, they covered the coast, and they did a programme a couple of years ago uh, about the east coast of Sweden, and part, part of the programme is factually inaccurate, uh, first of all, but, but there was a link to Scotland, which they omitted 
to actually highlight in the programme. Um, and I think it goes back to your point there just about, about being relevant. And I think if programmes, uh, irrespective of whether it's BBC or, or ITV or anyone else, but if programmes actually uh, ensure that the link to either Scotland or the UK or particular communities uh, was actually highlighted, then I think that would probably strengthen uh, the particular case. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you. I think relevance to your audience is always going to improve the audience's connection with the, with the programming. You know, when I was working in news, both in Ireland and, and previously at the BBC, uh, you'd always look at what would connect international stories to, to UK life or UK communities, because you can have great stories, but if there's also a connection in some way through people or through um, issues, then that undoubtedly makes it more relevant and more interesting. So, yeah, I would support what you're saying, yeah. OK, no, no, thank you for that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, if I could just go back to the, this whole issue of um, of diversity and the two public purposes in terms of the creative economy and portrayal. By the 1st of April, the BBC has to have a, uh, a code of practice in place uh, over um, di diversity. Um, and I just wondered how they were going to be measured in terms of how, they're, uh, how, how you intend to measure them, and particularly in terms of the, what I talked about earlier and the public <coughs> purpose around portrayal yep. uh, of authentic uh, voices and authentic stories from Scotland, because we have a way to measure uh, the public purpose in terms of supporting the creative economy, uh, and many people would say that's very, very flawed, and I might come back to that again. Uh, but we don't seem to have at the moment a, a way to measure this issue of portrayal, which I understand is difficult and it's subjective. Um, uh, for example, you know, like I think some broadcasters would argue, you know, setting a, a drama in Edinburgh for the backdrop, but there's absolutely nothing else that's an authentic uh, Scottish production about it, w would fulfil that portrayal uh, uh, obligation, but. Many people would say it doesn't. But anyway, to, how do you actually, how are you intending to measure that issue of portrayal and diversity so that S Scottish voices and Scottish stories uh, are told across the UK and, and get the funding uh, that network programmes get to, to tell those stories? Um, yes, so that's a good, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's something we've been spending quite a long time talking about. So one of the tools that we have, which is probably the most powerful tool, is going to be measuring what the BBC does every year. Um, you know, and I think our audience research people at Ofcom have already have a good, very good external reputation. And these are some of the exact issues they've been looking at, which is a robust measurement of these kind of things. And it'll, you know, and, and this is a, a range of measures we're going to use. It's not just, uh, you know, not, hours of programs on screen. It's also going out, talking to audiences. Um, and you're right, it's quite hard to measure how people feel they've been portrayed. Is it authentic or not? But we're using every kind of audience measurement tool we can do. Alongside, as I said to you, the first we decided the first ad hoc report was going to be about representation and portrayal of the peoples of the UK, which involves an even deeper dive into that issue, because we think it is really important. And you know, you go around talking to all the um, uh, in various uh, stakeholders and politicians and so on around the UK. And this is the, the issue that comes up all the time, which is how authentically are Scottish people shown to themselves and shown to the rest of the people of the UK. So we want to use the full range of measures we can. We'll publish that very openly. <clears throat> As often, I think, transparency about this, putting the figures out there in a independent, transparent way, saying, yes, the BBC is doing a good job in this area, but not so good in, in that area, is the most powerful tool quite often. And, you know, uh, my colleagues in audience research, and they're working closely with Glenn and his colleagues up here, looking at, um, you know, what is the best way to do that um, using the full range of tools we have. And we'll publish that probably in October as part of our assessment of year one of the BBC uh, with an independent regulator. Your, your own audience uh, advisory um, council, is that the title? Uh, I was reading um, the, their document from July this year, and they were actually, they were was quite encouraged, but they were quite cr critical of the way things operate at the moment. And one of the things they talked about was uh, commissioners 
uh, and where commissioners were based uh, in terms of commissioning that authentic programming that the portrayals that we've just been talked about and this committee has had quite a bit of a um, to and froing with the BBC as to what how powerful their drama commissioner for example in Scotland really is because everybody in the industry tells us that the decisions are really made in London now as your audience uh, uh, your your um, advisory council says um, a commissioner that's not based in the nations and regions will, will look at things in a completely different way to, to one who is. And perhaps that's the reason why with these sort of big budget network commissions, you know, for example, we just know our whole canon of Scottish literature, for example, is very, very, very seldom portrayed on television. Whereas, you know, much as I love Dickens, you know, there's been about three or four repeats. You know, every few years, the BBC repeats a big budget drama version of the classics of English literature, but they don't usually uh, ever actually um, reflect the Scottish canon. And that's something that comes up all the time uh, when you speak to the cultural sector in Scotland. Um, what are you going to do about that in terms of, because, you know, clearly in terms of portrayal, um, that's not working. So what are you going to do about that in, term, in your regulations? Well, I mean, you're right. I think where commissioners are based and who they talk to and how easy it is to pitch them is a really important part of improving portrayal and representation. Um, you know, I would be encouraged um, to see that of the relatively few members of the BBC executive who are on the board, one of them is Ken Macquarie, who's a very... Um, persuasive voice um, for Scotland and for the nations and regions as a whole in terms of portrayal. So, um, you know, and I've spoken to Ken about this and, uh, you know, it's in his blood, as you well know, better than I do probably. Um, so some of those key appointments are really important. You know, I would say uh, Dinalda and Steve Carson, you know, it's a powerful team up here and Steve Carson worked previously in Northern Ireland so he knows his way around the commissioning processes within the BBC so uh, having the right people based here is really important um, you know I we all we can do all we can do is for how the BBC organizes its management and its teams is a matter for the BBC board and it's not for us to decide where they're based or or, or um, you know where decisions are taken if you like but what we can do is show what the impact of those decisions are and uh, question some of those decisions and and present the facts back to the BBC if you're not doing well enough in this particular area are there other things you need to do about it but it's one of the public purposes that's been laid down so yeah. presumably they have to be forced to uh, as part of their license they they have to meet that public purpose they do and they know they need to do better on it they said that themselves and we've made it very clear and that's why Particularly, we focus on that in year one. On you know, the ad hoc report is uh, it's one of the most powerful tools we have to shine a light on a particular area of the BBC. Now, there were a number of areas contending for w what we thought was the priority. We chose this as a priority, and uh, you know, the upshot will be a really the most comprehensive picture we've had yet of the, how the BBC is doing in that area. And hopefully, it'll be a useful tool to them, and they have to think about how they can do that better. I would come back to you know, it is. I don't think anyone would want the regulator deciding how to. Where the B, who, who's managing the BBC or where they should be based because, uh, you know, the BBC is in a better position to make those kind of decisions and they should be. But it is your job to ensure that... They it is our job to hold them to purposes. account on how they're yeah. doing in a general way, absolutely. And it's, yeah. not, it's not just the BBC. I mean, Channel 4, I noticed in your list of Scottish productions includes Alan, a Channel 4 production of Alan Titchmarsh following the footsteps of E.E. Milne around uh, Harrods uh, toys, toy department and and Surrey, and that's the Scottish programme apparently as well. Um, and just, just finally, to, to go back to the regulations that we can measure in terms of the creative economies, uh, the, the, the supporting the creative economies, there's, there's three criteria that they have to meet two out of the three criteria. Um, one is uh, the executive based in Scotland, and the other, is, is this, the other two are relating to spend and, and where people are employed. Um, do you see those three criteria changing as a result of your review for out of London spending? Because clearly, you know, it's some of the issues around, I think particularly where the executives are based, you could have one or, one or two executives based in the Glasgow office, and that would be, you know, one of your two um, criteria met. And it's clearly for many people, they don't think that's good enough. So I, 
uh, obviously you can't prejudge. I mean, there's a huge amount of work going on on this. Are those three criteria satisfactory in themselves? That's one of the things we're looking at. How are they being interpreted is another thing we're looking at. What does a permanent base mean? What is the, important of a permanent, the importance of a permanent base? Do you want to exclude uh, other UK companies coming and in, uh, making you know, a very significant film or drama or whatever in Scotland because they don't meet one of those criteria? So these are, you know, these are all areas we're looking at. What I would say is you know, currently the information that is available you know, the, the the broadcasters have a ticker box saying, are the executive based in Scotland? And they tick a box saying, yes, they are. And that's as far as it goes. Now, is that enough information? My, my view, probably not. And again, transparency is a huge tool. If you have to give more information, when you tick that box, you say the executive um, or the management is based in Scotland, the, I, I think there should be another thing saying, well, what does that mean? And so that's maybe something that we can see Next yeah, and, and well, we will go out to consultation on this, and we really welcome the views of this committee in terms of you know the options that are out there and issues that you think are that we should be looking at. Yeah, and and so how will you deal with how will you deal with complaints when some someone says that a program has been incorrectly um, identified where they've ticked the box and it's not true? Well, I think that's another key area we're looking at. Do we have a robust enough complaint system? Uh, you know, at the moment it tends to be. Producers will come to us and say, "Can you have a look at this program?" And it, uh, and we we have we we have actually, and I think I've looked at your list of 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 programs. There are question marks over. We have gone back to the broadcasters and asked for more information, and that will form part of our uh, decision making looking going forward. These were these were productions that qualified ostensibly on the criteria. What did that actually mean? Um, and when we ask for more information, which we have now gone to the broadcast, I think on all those programmes to ask for more information, we want to see what that turns up. I think so. There's, there's one additional point that's worth adding there around transparency. Um, I think for all sorts of complaints that we receive uh, in relation to uh, broadcasting, uh, we have really well established routes where we are transparent. We publish a broadcast bulletin every couple of weeks which outlines the sorts of complaints we've received, whether or not we're going to pursue them and, and eventually what the outcome is. That's less true in, rela in relation to the Made Out of London guidance. It isn't as transparent a process and I think you're, it's absolutely one of the spaces I think we'll have to, have to review uh, in the next few months. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, when will things change? Well, I think we've I think we've said we'd expect to expect it to happen during 2018. Um, so uh, we we are, we are statutorily obliged to consult on these sorts of things. So um, and we have a we have a method of doing scoping to go and talk to the people affected by it before we do our formal consultation. What, so, at some point in 2018, we'll see a new set of guidelines that they've got to adhere to. When do you think that will be? Or yeah, will so we see a new set of guidelines published by yourselves? Yes. Yeah. Well, either a new set of guidelines or a new framework around the existing guidelines, if we decide those are the right ones, but need to be uh, adhered to in a more transparent way, for example. So I don't know. I don't want to prejudge what the outcome is. It's a new set of guidelines or a new system around the guidelines with more transparency and a better complaint system. I don't know. Those are all the options we're looking at. But in terms of the timetable, yes, throughout 2018. So we will, uh, early in 2018, we'll go out and ask for formal inputs into the process. We'll then put out our initial thinking probably around springtime, and we would hope towards the end of the year that we will have a conclusion, or a, which again we'll have to put out a consultation. So, but it will be um, we're aiming to get it out, done, and dusted uh, in 2018. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Ross Creer. Did you have a question? Yes. Uh, thanks, Camino. Just going back to the issue of representation, the BBC, uh, amongst all, all broadcasters, but the BBC in particular has come under some quite profound criticism uh, for its failure to represent class accurately, um, both in terms of staffing, particularly at senior level, and in representation and casting, and that uh, particularly with drama, it's overwhelmingly drama is set in a, a middle class or upper middle class situation, and when that's not the case, when it is set in a working class situation, the casting is often of actors who are themselves from upper middle class backgrounds cast into working class roles. Um, in your uh, diversity report from September, you looked at a range of characteristics, the three that you can compel broadcasters to give you information on, and a range of others under the Equality Act that you requested, but class wasn't part of it. My understanding is that of the back of that report, Ofcom has asked broadcasters to start providing you more information on the class makeup of um, their staffing, etc. I was wondering if you could explain why that came off the back of the report and wasn't 
part of the information you requested to be included in that report? Um, well, I think suffice it to say this this is a probably one of the more difficult ones to measure, if you like. <clears throat> However, it's one of the biggest issues facing the UK broadcasters, and I think by their own admission. Um, uh, and I think there's only two professions, as far as I, I heard, uh, I understood this, and this is not fact, someone told me this, there are only two professions that are less inclusive than the media. One is journalism, the other is medicine. Well, probably, pol no, probably not politics, actually, but medicine is another one. So there has been, there is work going on about it. It is that one of the hardest things to measure. How do you say which social background people come from? There is no doubt, though, and the broadcasters know this, and, and actually quite a few of them, Channel 4, the BBC, have put in place some quite good new initiatives now about apprentice schemes and so on to try and you know, open that up more. They've stopped doing, to a large extent, stopped doing unpaid internships, which is in their own way exclusive because people can't afford to do it if you come from a particular part of the country or a particular background. So they are doing measures. And I know talking to people at Channel 4, ITV and the BBC, for example, that and Sky too, these are things they're actively focusing on. They know this is a real issue for them. It is a problem about trying to measure it in a robust way. How do you characterize someone as coming from a particular part of society? You know, is it because their parents didn't go to university? Is it because they live in a particular area? It's not as easy to, 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 to get definitive figures about it, but it is a major issue. And it's certainly one of the issues we'll be looking at in terms of representation as a whole, and we're working on how do you define it is one of the key things. Is, have the broadcasters responded positively to your request in future? That's information they, they provide you with. Uh, they have, well, they've responded positively in, in that this is an area of uh, concern. I think the, the work, the discussions that go on at the moment is how do we define that? Because we don't have a necessarily a solution. There may be particular ways you can define it, you may be looking at particular measures that individual broadcasters are taking. So I think the honest answer is it's work in progress. We've I all identified it as a significant area, you know, as John Snow did in his speech at the festival here, TV festival, quite rightly. But I don't think people have the answers to a lot of things, including how do you measure it effectively. Thanks. This Parliament has passed legislation in terms of university intake to ensure that a broader range of social class gets into university based on postcodes and other criteria. Well, on that topic, wh when you apply for a job with BBC Scotland, in order to ensure diversity, you've got to tick a box uh, voluntarily about your, your background, and there's a whole uh, host of different um, uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, included, included in Irish, white Irish, but, but Scot Scottish doesn't actually appear. Um, I know sp being Scottish isn't actually a protected characteristic, but given the context that we're talking in today, do you think it, do you think perhaps they should be asking people if they're Scottish when they apply to BBC Scotland? Well, I don't know. That's opening a can of worms. I think you better be, better put that to the BBC rather than to us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I will now bring the, this evidence session to a close. And I thank our witnesses for coming today. And we're suspending. And we're, we're suspending going to private session. Thanks.